My name is Chris Clark, and I'm a uh, convert. So I'm in the process of transitioning out of uh, Cornell University, where I've been uh, for 26 years. I started in a really big uh, lab with about 60 full-time employees, et cetera, et cetera. Came out of the world of uh, I'm a, a double E electrical engineer, as also a biologist. Uh, okay. So I'm a hybrid. Um, the the seed that got planted long ago was in uh, working with large uh, whales, great whales, and trying to figure out what they were saying. And of course, as uh, if you listen to the ocean, you can't avoid hearing all the crap we put into it. Um, and then um, in the early 1990s, with the fall of the Soviet Union, um, I was asked to be the lead marine scientist with the U.S. Navy using their underwater anti-submarine listening system network on the North Pacific and the North Atlantic, and I'm still doing that today. And that was a um, epiphanal um, experience for me because what seemed uh, impossible, uh, those of you who might be old enough to remember a movie called Dr. Strange Glove, where suddenly, or, or if you've ever read C.S. Lewis's trilogy, you're suddenly walking into this place where I can listen to anywhere I want to in the North Pacific and North Atlantic Oceans. And then I went, that's when I was first introduced to the concept of big data. So I would liken that to acoustically to a suddenly going from one of those little play toy telescopes you had as a kid. Because as a scientist, I would go out in a boat or I'd deploy equipment in the ocean, put it dive it in, run a cable onto shore, listen to one channel in one little place, and suddenly, no, I'm in a stationary orbit satellite looking down the ocean and I can pick where it is I want to listen. So I liken it to the Hubble telescope of acoustics. And the technology um, still exists, and uh, the name was classified at one point. It was called SOSIS. Um, now we have Son of SOSIS and Grandson of SOSIS and Lemon Fresh SOSIS and all those other things. Right? Um, <clears throat> so, I'm a convert. Uh, I arrived in uh, California on Friday with my wife. My children are all out here. Our, our daughter-in-law is a research assistant, or research associate, sorry, uh, at Stanford here, and he's finishing his PhD at Berkeley, and my other daughter is already working out here. So, we're moving out here, and I'm joining Planet OS. All right, I've been working with, them, with Reiner for almost two years. And to me, again, it's another epiphanal moment. It's like, wait a minute, the way we do things at Cornell, it's like we're rubbing two sticks together, guys. And you might find a start a fire every once in a while, and you might get it going a little bit, but you're one little tiny dot in upstate New York drinking wine and watching waterfalls, all right? You're not going to change what's going on. So you're working with policy, is that what you said? Um, I'm the person scientist, but I'm... Yeah. So in my world, I've gone through the whole thing of watching the Environmental Impact Statements, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, all the legal things, and I, I know exactly what you're talking about, where as a scientist, you're down there in the nerdy little world of all these little data bits, and the regulator says, hey, listen, I just need to know, is it there or is it not there on an eight-week basis? Yes or no? Binary. That's it. Can you do it? No uncertainty. Or at least very specific uncertainty. Give me a number, right? Um, so, these are the, basically the themes, and you can think of this as a metaphor. It's in, it's in the marine world right now, but now we're talking about global. You all know we're in trouble, right? The environment is under con incredible stress. We have a lot of denial going on, right? So we have the hooded members who walk around humming to themselves, and, you know, whatever that metaphor is. But we've got to do something about it, and what is so exciting to me about Marine Explorer and I would, I would say that Marine, I'm sorry, Planet OS, <laughs> um, is that it's, it's, a, it's a conceptual paradigm led by a group of incredibly talented, motivated, highly motivated, dedicated individuals that form a team. And what Reiner's group has done in two years, I worked on all kinds of blue ribbon, scientific, whoop de doo things. We had our epaulets, we had our cone hats, we had incense, we had the whole Right? And nothing ever happened. We'd write reports and go on the shelf, right? Two years, Planet OS has built a system that I've watched NOAA, 
I've got neon, I've got oh, IOS. How many IOSs or OOSs do you know about? OOS is up the Yazoo. What do they do? Not much. We don't have time to fool around, right? Oh, this is my little, you know, beam me up Scotty thing, right? And then some reality. <clears throat> there are no known deaf marine vertebrates. Big whales, there are 100 species, you know, dolphins, seals, whatever, but we have laws that protect them. That's the tip of the legal spear in our country for protecting the marine acoustic environment. No known deaf fishes. And now what's being discovered? Oh, invertebrates. Invertebrates, oh, they make sound, they rely on sound. Look at the pyramid. How many invertebrates are there, right? Go look at data from coral reefs. It's pathetic, right? You have a few people putting out little little sensors here and there, right? We should be populating these places and really be get, gaining an understanding of what's happening to the reefs. The lower slide there, I'll blow up, and this is something that uh, you may not realize, but then if you lived in California long enough, you've probably heard about the, the mess that Scripps got into 20 years ago with the, the big uh, project they were trying to run with our, um, Walter Monk and company called the Acoustic Thermometry of Ocean Climate Project. And there they were trying to gain data, understand the thermodynamics of heat exchange between the atmosphere and the ocean, and they got caught up in the whoop de doo the craziness of environmental outrage, because in the permitting process you have to say something, and we had to say that we were going to take tens and hundreds of thousands of marine mammals, right? Anyway, that was a disaster. But the point is, you can set up a small charge off of Perth. This was 1967, small charge off of Perth, and that's 10-pound charge put energy in the water and it traveled halfway around the world into the North Atlantic and North Pacific. And this was picked up, this is a very simplified version because sound doesn't travel obviously in highways, but three and a half hours later it arrived in the North Atlantic, three and a half hours later it arrived in all the Navy listening stations in the North Pacific. That's the way sound travels. And this little arrow here is to tell you that what's, it's July, so uh, back in uh, March, using that same system, I listened to a blue whale singing off of Ireland. I l listened to it from a, syst a, a single hydrophone, like a, my own system, off of Norfolk, Virginia, 3,000 miles away. So sound travels very efficiently in the ocean. Everybody uses it. And so we have energy economics, and you could also put in here um, military defense. They use the, mar the marine environment. Um, and again, this is somewhat for your entertainment, but it's, this is real. So this is a blue whale song I've converted into a sound um, image. So frequency pitch is on the vertical, time is on the bottom. This is roughly 18 minutes. And if I play this for you at 60, no, sorry, 30 times normal speed, you'll hear it. So this is 650 miles away. It's so low that you wouldn't hear it because it's infrasonic. And one note takes 25 seconds and it's repeated every 70 seconds again. And I sat on the knee of a, when I was 21 years old, a runny nose graduate student in Argentina working with a man who had just published a paper predicting that once upon a time blue whales could be heard across an ocean basin. And so it was a very, it was a real emotional thrill for me to actually be in that Navy place and realize, wait a minute, that sound is coming from 650 miles away. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so let's just pretend that the Berkeley, the Berkeley campus is the North Atlantic or North Pacific Ocean. And you have sensors, you have people distributed around the campus, and they all have really good ears, and they can do this with their heads, right? And they hear something. And you're the puppeteer, and you're looking down in the Berkeley campus, and you can probe any one of those sensors. And you're visualizing, you literally have a screen for every one of them, and actually, each, each screen is divided up into a whole series of sections because each of those sensors divides the world up into a little pie chart, right? 
and those are called beams or sectors, right? So a sound comes up, woo, like this, and every you just go, okay, point all the, find all the directions that point to all that place. Everybody crosses the beams. You know, remember what was that movie? Don't cross the Ghostbusters. Don't cross the beams, right? But you cross the beams, and they all point to the same thing. So I can, we literally can pick out individual voices, <laughs> individual singers, and track them because you have this enormous network. It was built with billions of dollars of your grandparents and parents' money, taxpayers' money, to track Soviet submarines. Now remember, this animal is singing at 180 to 190 decibels for one micropascal. A submarine is trying to be as quiet as possible. This is a male out there advertising himself, right? It's the, it's the bird at the top of a tree, you know, jumping up and down and going, hey baby, hey baby, hey baby. It's really easy. So when I first challenged one of the young uh, analysts in the Navy to do this, I said, do you think you could track this guy? He went, hey, right? Okay. Yeah, six packs and a pint of Seagram's. That was the bet. <laughs> he got his money. I got my data and he got his beer. <laughs> right? right? So, so here's Ireland, right? And here, here I'm just going to show you a little map in the animation. Each one of these dots represent a position where I've crossed the beams, I've located the position of a singer. And I'm just going to animate this, and you'll see all the dots. I'm just, just animating it, and your eye does the integration, you see tracks, right? So I didn't hear anybody say that they were a computer scientist or an applied mathematician, but one of the big questions in this is, is there any communication going on, right? These are these are not, these animals are never seen. I have friends over in the UK who say, oh, you got whales off of Ireland. I want to go out in my sailboat this weekend. And you're going, I don't think so. 200 miles to the west of Ireland in the middle of winter is not what you call a weekend, right? But so one of the questions is, can we actually show that there's communication going on in this network, just like fireflies? You know, fireflies will go into synchronization. Well, what's going on here? But that's the that's a 100,000 square mile area, right? So roughly it's a community, <laughs> but that's scale. And then we can go down to really small scales, like in Cape Cod Bay off Massachusetts, where I've installed my own Navy network as a researcher. So each one of these is a node. It's a sensor node and the synchronized node, and I can then do tracking just like I do in the Navy system, but here it's in Cape Cod Bay. And these are the calls of uh, right whales, these highly endangered species which regulatory purposes, right whale occurrence along the East Coast is going to be driving the actions of offshore energy development. So you may not know it, but the, the East Coast of the United States is being opened up for energy exploration. Not sustainable totally, but energy exploration. Virginia is the first one. What a surprise, right? Anyway, so we can collect these kinds of data. Now this is still a researcher named Chris Clark at Cornell University rubbing two sticks together. All right? I think it's a big deal. I'm sampling in a little puddle 25 by 25 miles wide, you know, continuously, blah, blah, blah. These data are not so small. And then we run into the, yeah. So what, what volume of data are you talking about? The bad versus the bad. bad. All right. So, um, in real time. In real time. Okay, so in, in, in this, I'm collecting hundreds of channels of data every second, right? At relatively low volume because high, low frequency sound is what you're interested in. High frequency sound, anything above a couple of kilohertz doesn't travel very far in the ocean, right? So any of you have ever had, to li had the pl privilege of listening to a humpback whale singing if you go to you know, Hawaii and you surf and you dive in the water, you'll hear, but what you'll hear is all low frequency. So we're collecting in, in this meta, in this world, I'm collecting, you know, mm, 10 years of data a year or something like that. In, in this world, I'm collecting many, many hundreds of years of data a year, right? That's just raw data. There's, and there's not much you can do with it, as, as Ryan was saying, Raw data is, you know, raw data. 
Oh, volumes? Okay, so we're now in, in, in this world, I, you know, I've got a petabyte. And that's after 20 years. Now, it's, the rate has been going up, whereas in this world, you know, you get a, a petabyte a, easily a year every six months. And what we're finding with, with say, NOAA, which has all the weather data and whatnot, um, they, they can't serve their data. It's too big, it's growing, they can't manage it. Um, so then we get into the commercial shipping traffic, <clears throat> which is imposing a, a huge cost on the ocean ecosystem. In my sense, it's, I con consider it the ocean acoustic ecosystem or the acoustic habitat, because everybody's dependent upon sound, but they can't hear it. So we, uh, this is a bit of a repeat, but right now, for example, off Boston, we've, uh, we've now, this is the seventh year, we installed an uh, integrated ocean observation system off Boston in the, uh, the shipping lane coming in and out of Boston. That's all paid for by commerce, the industry. In order to uh, install and build liquefied natural gas terminals off Boston, the requirement for their permit was you've got to put in a network a real-time network of sensors that automatically detects endangered species. So you could go online, go right now, and just go listenforwhales.com, and you'll find it, and you can get the data. And that, that is a little, it's a, a, a peanut in the soup to nuts uh, thing. This is what people should be doing. We should have a network of multi-sensory data going down both coasts, you know, off our various um, territories and whatnot, so that the public has access and science has access to ocean data on a large scale, multi-sensory. This is just acoustic. What's the permanent placement of those sensors? Like, how do you know that you needed 10 as opposed to two? Ah, okay. Yeah, this is this is a great story in itself because if you wanted to see sort of a, a Shakespearean, or maybe no, maybe it's really a Gilbert and Sullivan thing where you had to have all the agencies in there, you had to have the NGOs were in there, the scientists were in there, and the business was in there. And in, in the early part of the discussion, there were some people saying, oh, well, let's build a network and we'll do real-time detection and real-time localization and tracking and blah, 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 and you're going, and then there's a guy from the industry going, look at every day I'm sitting in this room, it costs me a million dollars just to waste my time. When a ship comes in from Nigeria or the Congo with liquefied natural gas on it and it comes in here they set the track of that ship long beforehand there's an officer of the deck there are like a half a dozen people in that ship we're not screwing around looking for whales just tell us what we should do and so what do they do they plan their trip and when as soon as they get down into the channel down here which is like the Grand Central Station coming into New York and whatnot everything's on automatic they just said, we'll slow down to 10 knots. If that's the rule, we'll slow down to 10 knots. So they slow down to 10 knots. So they slow down to 10 knots. And these are spaced because this is where, where I have a very high probability, I know from probability, that I, if there's a whale in here that makes a call, I'll detect it. And the simple rule is, we're not going to locate, we're not going to track, just tell us if you hear a whale. If we heard a whale within 24 hours, we're done. That's it. Really simple. And this is the just... Is there, is there a one or a zero over the last week? That's all I need to know. Because business works very differently than science. Um, so what's been, you know, now we have the automatic information system. We can, um, we can track and map scientifically. We can map all the noise and quantify the noise. So these are acoustic footprints from a, a ship. So this glow represents the energy that's put in the water by a commercial ship. And we are, these are all empirical data. These are the whales. We had 89 whales in the area based on NOAA surveys. These are the ships. And there you can see the LNG terminal right there where there's a ship on station. These are literally, that's the acoustic footprint. That's how much space that noise takes up in the ocean. It's been a big uh, NOAA sound mapping group that I'm part of where the challenge was, okay, let's map all commercial shipping, let's noise in the ocean, big data. You wouldn't believe how long it took to get that data together. Oh, my God. It was like, and we had no money, of course, because NOAA's broke. So they, we had bake sales, we had car washes, you know, we went to church, whatever it was. We volunteered our time. 
and the um, the biologists. So I'm split brain. I'm a biologist and engineer. The biologists were saying, "Oh, we want the resolution down to be one kilometer by one kilometer, and we want to do it at 16 different depths in the ocean, and we want it on a minute by minute basis." You know, you just take your pencil out and you go, "Well, guess what? That's about 10 to the 23rd." You know, this is like, what is it? Number of you know, you know moles or Avogadro's number or something. You're going, "Wait a minute, this isn't going to work." So this is on a one degree by one degree resolution, three depths, one year, and we could do it. And this just shows the aggregation. It was a, it was a homework assignment with a lot of smart people in a room realizing this is as far as we could get. This is as good as we can do. Now, if you're trying to make a decision based on the, this granularity, you can't make a decision on this granularity. But we at least showed the people that were supposed to give us the money that the problem. Seismic exploration offshore. Probably nobody in this room recognizes how much activity is going on in the world's oceans right now searching for oil and gas by setting off a massive explosion every 10 seconds for months at a time. This is an old way of doing it. A single ship towing an air gun array behind a ship, right? Um, the scale of ocean exploration right now is off the charts. And this is just using sound. In other places, they have large vacuum cleaners that they just go along and suck up the bottom of the ocean. Like, off, like Australia's flipped, New Zealand's flipped, uh, Canada's flipped. Those are not green anymore. Looking for uh, rare, rare earth minerals, right? They just suck it up, take them out, whatever. I'm going to show you an animation of scale. This is 100,000 square miles. This is to the west of Ireland. And I'm mapping not sea surface temperature or whatever it is. You want elevation. This is mapping noise. And this is my scale, dB scale. So it's a four orders of magnitude from 60 to 100, relatively speaking. Something really loud is down here. It's relatively quiet in here. And I tuned it because as a scientist, what I was looking for is I wanted to see whether the whales in there, because I can, when, if a whale makes a sound in this frequency band singing, it lights up, right? It flashes. And I wanted to see, oh, maybe if I animate this, my mind will do the integration, and I'll see, oh, look, there's a pattern. I'm seeing the pattern, right? Because we're really good at finding patterns. That's what I did. And I didn't select this for any other reason than that. So this is one week, and these flashes, those are the acoustic footprints from singing fin whales. And then that happened. I went, what the, what the heck is that, right? And the, let me also tell you, so the way we were analyzing these data, John, was we would open the data shutter of the data camera. We'd open it up for one minute every 15 minutes. Take all the data in one minute, map the energy, wait 14 minutes, do it again, do it again. So every frame is a one minute open shutter, map it every 15 minutes. And what turns out what was down here was a seismic exploration vessel. Right now, this is a hundred thousand square miles. Now I'm probably off the subject of big data, but this is this I consider relatively big data. We now have 15 years of continuous data in a hundred thousand square miles at this resolution. When I go into a meeting with the regulatory agencies and the NGOs and the oil companies, or I'm at a conference that's looking at the impact of you know anthropogenic noise on ocean systems. And someone stands up, and the regulation says you have to have people with binoculars on the ship, and they have to clear the area around the ship out to one kilometer. One kilometer. And they have to do that all the time. Well, one kilometer isn't even a pixel on the screen, right? And you show them the footprint, and they say, well, we never see any whales, because we never see any whales. Well, of course you don't see any whales. Any self-respecting whale wouldn't come near your ship, they'd be running the hell out of there, right? In fact, in this area, I can show what happens on this scale, which would never be available on a typical scientific experimental scale, because scientifically to do this, you'd be living under one pixel. But on this scale, I can watch this scene prior to any seismic ship getting in there, and the whales will just evacuate, 100,000 square miles. But those, that scale and that analysis is not available under typical 
ways of doing business, right? I'm trying to understand how many I can't tell you. A lot, right? A lot. But we're doing this on land now. We're setting up sensor sensor arrays in in uh, New York and New England, and uh, UCLA was doing some down south, where you can put microphone or sensors. You can just, they're cheap. You can just distribute them. You can set up a whole wireless network system, right? Um, but in this case, it's it's in water. Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is one week. A frame every 15 minutes. This is very, very loud. This is very, very soft. So there, there's some fishing boats down here, and then there's a seismic vessel down there. And you'll see the flashes are the where the whales are singing. And what turned out was um, my sampling is aliased. Right? I'm only opening the shutter every 15 minutes. The whales sing for somewhere between 12 and 20 minutes, and they take a break. So that's why if I did it, now we're doing it at every three minutes, and then you just see it, it constant, and then it goes off, constant, and then it goes off. OK. So that's when I just gave this presentation in front of Congress a couple weeks ago. I put it on top of Washington, DC, and say, there's your footprint, right? All right. This is not just in your backyard. This is a pretty big area. And they're about to open, it, open up this entire central uh, mid-Atlantic coast. So this is where big data comes in. So I, I hope uh, you sort of get a sense of my enthusiasm about this and my frustration with the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things is that Marine Explorer Planet OS is a, a totally different paradigm. And I'll give you one more example of, of how this has totally changed my entire outlook and why I've left Ithaca and come to California. Um, although I'll live anywhere on the planet. I, doesn't really bother me. Um, two years ago, um, actually a year and a half ago, I met um, someone else who was in uh, Marine Explorer at that time, Andre Karpyshenko. And Andre had, was the founder of Skype Analytics. Very, very smart uh, data scientist, uh, uh, computer scientist. And we're having a conversation. I'm telling you about this whole thing. We're trying to find r really rare events in really large data sets. And this, in this case, it was an acoustic event in a very complex acoustic scene, very rare. And I s explained it as though it's like Where's Waldo, you know, that thing where you have pictures and you got to find that one little rare event or like the foot of the dog just sticking out in the, um, the book illustration. And he said, oh, well, let's have a Kaggle competition. I said, oh, Kaggle competition, sure, okay. So he got in touch with the folks from Kaggle. This, they do scientific, they host scientific competitions. Kaggle put up $8,000. Green Explorer, pre-Planet OS, put up $2,000. So we had $10,000 cash prizes. We had the data, and guess what? It was in a legitimate database. It wasn't in Excel files. It was in an actual real database, because data, really good data systems are really important. Andre came to my lab, took the data in about 15 seconds, put it up on a competition, right? Within Eight weeks, we had over 230 competitors. Oh, the deal is, I get the code, right? I got the code. We had over 30 of them were perform had performances at better than 90%. The highest we had ever done in my lab with months and years of postdocs and when I was like 87 or something like that, right? I didn't have to advertise for a job. I don't know if any of you have to hire people advertise, go through HR, all that kind of stuff. The bureaucracy is just strangling, right? I didn't have to hire anybody. I didn't have to fire anybody. It was open. It's just what Reiner said before. Put the data out there, right? The value isn't in the data. The value is in the data products in the time that you get. And this is what Andre also told me. He said, you're competing today for people's time and their minds, right? And what we don't want them to do is spend time listening to some Coke machine talk to them as they walk through the mall buying new pair of shoes, right? You want their time to be spent doing something valuable, right? So that's where it's so, to me, so uh, engaging and so inspiring. It's like, oh, okay. And then I start working with the people at Planet OS and going, oh, okay. Here, I'm working with ExxonMobil, ConocoPhillips, BP, uh, NOAA, right? Uh, people in commerce, people in um, interior, 
people in transportation. They all need answers. And they're never, never going to get their answers out of these little candles and stick rubbing contests we have in labs in R1 universities. Sorry, at least not in the one that I came from. And I hate to be so disparaging. Yes, you want to go to college, you want to have a good education. But you know what? If we protect in my building, in my department, which I'm in neurobiology behavior, the old one, I now sort of put it aside. The barriers between adjacent laboratories are greater than the barriers between me and the rest of the world. And it's absolutely absurd, right? Put the data out there. Put the mechanisms for access to the data in a coherent way. And it to totally resonates with me when I first was talking with Reiner and they were saying, well, how much time do you spend moving data files around? Oh my god, right? 80% of your time. So that's where that's, that's where this is going. And I can give you some, some really simple examples of here where we, we've jumped into the big data processing. We're working with uh, Jan LeCun and others in the, in the deep learning domain. So this is just an example where we took one year of data and we processed it in 45 minutes. In this case, I had a very crude uh, analysis by a human. It took her seven weeks. She's a trained analyst, seven weeks, and all she did was on an hourly basis, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. This resolution is down at a minute. This is at one hour, right, looking for thin widths. And this is on a small, a small high-performance computing system with like, you know, what do we have, like 68 workers or something like that, right? Um, so that's just a, that again was another little example. Of, um, so I, I think I've said enough. You get an idea of my enthusiasm and passion. And where I want to do is I want to work at that interface and help build these semi-permeable membranes of intelligence between the different entities. And something like Marine Explorer Planet OS is a very high energy, fast moving, high performance vehicle for making this happen. You're not going to do it through committees, you're not going to do it through large groups of people um, in a room, you know, rubbing sticks together. Um, anyway, that's, I could go on and on about, this is all technology kinds of things, because as an engineer, as this, I'm a DSP engineer, digital scientist, so I'm interested in uh, automatic detection classification of in complex scenes, and they can be acoustic scenes or visual scenes or whatever. Anyway, thanks.